Okay, thanks for tuning in to this audio abstract with um, Sophia Nymphius chatting about a change direction deficit, a more isolated measure of change direction performance than total 505 times. So thanks for tuning in and welcome, Sophia. Thank you, Rob. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about this paper. No, it's all good. It's all good. So as in audio abstract fashion, do you just want to um, firstly move down to the bottom and then we'll we'll work backwards and go from there? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess starting with the thing that most people are interested in, just the practical applications here. Um, you know, with this paper, what we were looking for was instead of just having a, a quote unquote research or a mechanistic understanding of change of direction deficit uh, or change of direction, excuse me, we were looking for something that coaches using their existing data could do without a lot of extra effort. And um, what we found is that by calculating the change of direction deficit, which we'll explain in a little bit, we could be narrowing the performance, and in this case, this is running a 505, to understanding how much extra time it takes that athlete to perform the 505 because of that 180 degree turn in this instance or for this uh, change of direction test. And what we found is that depending on whether you use the total time or the change of direction deficit measure, which again, we'll talk about in a second, you get very different outcomes. So from a practical um, standpoint, what we mentioned is that with minimal extra effort, a really simple subtraction calculation, you may be able to isolate the performance of change of direction instead of um, kind of confounding your measure of change of direction by basically reevaluating someone's sprint speed, which you already know if you've done a common sprint assessment, be that 10, 20, or 40 meters in length. So our major um, practical application is that with uh, this easy equation, we might be finally really looking at an athlete's ability to change direction relative to their um, speed, which you already assess in another fashion. Cool. So just move up a little bit and then take us through the the bits higher up the paper. That'd be cool. Sure. So I guess, I mean, we could go through the discussion, but um, the discussion will come out as we look through the results because that's, that's just how it happens. So probably the, the first part that we, we want to look at is, um, is to just look at the actual um, results of the paper that set it up. So we'll start here just with the normative data. So to get everyone on the same page, basically what we had here were cricket athletes. The cricket athletes um, ran a um, 505. And so the 505, for those of you that don't know, you have a, a run-up. You touch the line, so after a 15-meter run-up. And then you turn around 180 degrees and finish five more meters. The 505 time is from five meters before the turn line to five meters after. So you come into that turn with a quick velocity. And for those of you that know cricket, that it's really similar to basically running between the wickets. So um, it's very applicable to cricket, but if you're just looking for general capacity to maximally break, reorient yourself and maximally run the other way, it's applicable in other sports, say a backdoor cut in um, basketball or in, in football a um, you know, 180 degree turn maybe in tennis. So that heaps of sports do that, even if it doesn't seem like a major um, part of the sport. So simply ran the 505, and they also ran a 30 meter sprint. And then we took a very important split, which was the 10 meter split. And the reason you need the 10 meter split is with the change direction deficit, which is what we've calculated here. We basically say that if you have the time that it takes an athlete to run a linear distance that's equivocal to the distance you run during your change of direction test, you subtract those two and you basically get an understanding of how much extra time it takes that athlete to perform that total length. But because you had a change, that is your basic change of direction performance. So to explain it more simply, I'll use the numbers here. Um, an average athlete in this cohort ran um, a 505 on their preferred turn sign in 2.4 seconds about. That was a total of a 10 meter distance that they covered, but they had a 180 degree turn in the middle of that. So of course it's gonna take you longer to run that distance because you have to turn. 
you have to decelerate and then reaccelerate. If those same athletes ran just a 30 meter sprint, so maximal effort, at the 10 meter mark, they were finishing 10 meters in about 1.8 seconds. So if you subtract the mean of their 505 time and you take away from that their 10 meter split, the 0.6 thereabouts is the extra time it takes the average athlete to basically turn. And you know, really this equation, funny enough, although this isn't really in the research, if you look at the calculations for um, 3015 calculations and the number of turns that you take from Martin Boucher's work, you'll notice that he has a calculation in there that every time you add a turn to a change, it's multiplied by 0.7, I believe, or you add 0.7, excuse me. And it's not surprising that when someone does a 180 degree turn, in this case they're running a lot faster, that the average extra time it takes you there is 0.6. So obviously Martin had this idea in his head and he already integrated it in 3015 calculations, if you're familiar with that. But once we have that, then we have that quote unquote isolated measure of change of direction performance. So now you know we ran this straight, straight line test, we got a 10 meter split, and we ran our 505s both turning with a preferred and non-preferred side. And on average, it was 0.6, but you'll notice there's obviously that large degree of spread. And probably the major factor for us is to understand that an average represents nobody. So this data, not that it means nothing, but that's not how we write programs with athletes. What we do with athletes is we test them and we look at how they perform relative to the team mean. And then we want to know how they improve from there. So it's an individual performance assessment. So <clears throat> the first thing that we wanted to show was that when you just use total time, the reason we want a more isolated measure and we make that subtraction calculation is because so much of the 505 is just your acceleration capacity that you can make up for a poor change of direction performance by being exceptionally accelerative. So if you're really great coming out the blocks, so to speak, you can have a really piss poor change of direction, but still come out with maybe an above average performance in total 505 time, meaning you use your speed to make up for poor change of direction performance. So your performance test is actually masking your inability to change because the performance test isn't isolated enough on the physical capacity of changing direction. So how we, we double check that that still occurred is we just do the correlation between 505 total time and um, the linear sprint. And it always comes out quite high. So if you look at um, the correlation between someone's total um, 505 time here and their linear sprint time, either 30 or 10, you'll notice that it's always, it's always above 0.5. Um, whereas if you look at the correlation between the more isolated change of direction deficit, that's what we're calling more isolated anyway, and 10 meter sprint time, there's almost zero correlation. Now to put this in practical speak, you know uh, many athletes that can sprint like hell, but they couldn't stop if their life depended on it. We know that those two capacities are independent of one another, and that's why heaps of work previously, a lot of Jeremy Shepard's work has said that, you know, change of direction is a separate physical quality to sprint speed. So this shouldn't be surprising. And that's why we wanted to look at something different than total time, because in theory, if it is a separate quality, then the overlap between sprint speed and change of direction capacity shouldn't be that high, and indeed, in, indeed it is. So our first check for it being valid is that it actually doesn't correlate so high to sprint speed. Then the next thing that we did was we looked at, and we did it on preferred and non-preferred side with very similar outcomes, we looked at the individual performances, and this is probably inadvertently the second most important take home of this. As to one, when you test your team, yes, we look at means just to get an idea where everyone stands, but really we should be looking at the athlete's data individually um, because that's, that's where us as SMCs can actually write prescription that matters. And what we have is their performance standardized. So, of course, if you use total time, the average is about two and a half seconds to complete the 505. But you notice the change of direction deficit measure, like I mentioned before, was somewhere in six tenths of a second. There are two different sizes of time, so you can't compare them equally. They're different magnitudes. So we normalize them by using a standardized score so that it's basically Z scores or standard deviations 
away from the mean. So you can compare those apples and oranges now, even though they're different magnitudes. So now we have standardized scores. So if the value up here, that's less than average change of direction performance. And if it's down here, then it's better than average change of direction performance. Being negative is good because you're getting faster if you think of it like that. So you'll notice that in, in, in each individual athlete here, for the most part, the total score, total time, and the Z score as a change of direction deficit don't tell you the same story. Um, this is an example here. Every time there's a star, that means that the performance based on total time versus change of direction deficit actually told you an opposite story. To say it differently, sometimes the total time told you the athlete was better than average, while the Z score for change of direction deficit said they were worse than average, and then vice versa. So that means you could totally incorrectly characterize your athlete depending on which measure you chose to use. Typically what that indicates is that if you use total time, their linear sprint ability or inability is masking or confounding their change of direction performance score. And so only once you remove that factor from it can you isolate whether someone's good at changing direction or not because that's what you want to find out. You already know if they're fast or slow. And so, again, all of these start athletes are incorrectly evaluated. And in 15 of the 17 subjects, they were incorrectly assessed by at least a meaningful change, so 0.2 of a standard deviation. So even if they both said they were better than average, one said they were basically really good, where the other said it was only moderately good, you could define it as. So we were realizing that the amount of correlation or overlap between linear speed and change of direction total time was really masking our ability to identify who's good or bad at changing direction. And on the outside, you might go, oh, it, it wouldn't make too much of a difference. But if you do what I do, which is to go, okay, these people that are less than average, we're going to spend more of our training time focusing change of direction. And these people that are better than average, they're going to do something else with their time because they already have that attribute developed. You're not just mistakenly identifying that athlete in a test, but you could be mistakenly following this up with prescription for weeks and weeks and weeks that are targeting an area they either already are quite good at and, and the test misidentified, or you're not training because you assume they are good at it, but because of the value you chose or the, the measure you chose for their performance, incorrectly assess them. So <clears throat> the gist of this paper, instead of looking at individual performances here, I subtracted the Z scores, and this is just one bar. So basically, for these individual athletes, if you see this bar up here, it's an overestimate, overestimate of their change of direction ability or an underestimate. And you notice that in 16 of these 17 athletes, we over or underestimated it um, by at least a uh, standard deviation or 0.2 of a standard deviation, which we call the smallest worthwhile change. And then on the other side, so the non-preferred side, in 15 of 17 athletes, we either overestimated or underestimated that athlete by more than a smallest worthwhile change. So for me, I guess the take-home message was that for a long time, because we've always used that total time, and this is just in the 505, we, we could be doing a, a, a misjustice to a lot of our athletes as far as the subsequent prescription. And um, I, I base all of my prescription based on how that athlete is evaluated. And so for me, it's taking a step back and going, okay, are we doing the right, not necessarily are we doing the right tests, but are, you, are we using the right numbers? And as a practitioner, that was an important thing to me. I don't want to scrap these tests and this data that we've had for years and years. Because then we, we feel like we have to start over. But from the data we have, can we look at it better so that we make more informed decisions about the athlete's change of direction ability? And that's kind of what we came up here was the practical method of isolating change of direction performance. I don't know if it's the best method, and in fact, it is just a practical tool. 
Um, but I think in the future, we we may it may alight some things to start looking at change of direction performance a little differently, at least. Ah, superb. Just one thing I just want to ask you before I um, kind of sum it up was uh, limitations of the paper. Just something that I'd like to... Yeah, for sure. I, th- I think the major limitation with this is that um, we just don't have... Because you're narrowing the time... So change of direction occurs in a very small t- time frame. We all know that. It's highlight reel material. So it's those instants. It's an instant of a cut. So here we're saying in about six-tenths of a second... Um, that's when change of direction occurs. So your smallest worthwhile change is also very, very small. So what happens is that um, you're looking at very small changes give you a big change, if that makes sense. Um, whereas I guess that means that your the accuracy, the reliability of the athletes, so their ability to get basically the same score repeatedly, will determine how much smallest worthwhile change you require for a meaningful change in this. So you are narrowing it from two and a half seconds to six tenths of a second. So you're saying that, you know, five hundredths of a second is a meaningful change. So we just have to make sure that we have um, enough room and that the typical error of the measure isn't a lot higher than the smallest worthwhile change. Cool. So where can people get hold of the paper, Sophia? Yeah, so this paper is actually published in um, in JSCR. So it's a 2016 paper in JSCR. Or they can also go to ResearchGate as well. For those of you that um, cannot log on to NSCA, and you can get a a version prior to the nice formatted version we have here on um, ResearchGate, which, which is free for anybody to access once they sign up, I believe. Maybe also academia.edu. Cool. And one very last thing, where can people keep up to date with what you've got going on, social media-wise? Yeah, so uh, both uh, academia and I'm actually more on ResearchGate for new new okay. um, research publications or my Twitter, which I'll try to become more prolific on, but at DocSoph. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for that, Sophia. And... Um, Yeah, appreciate that. We'll speak soon. Fantastic.